What's up, you guys? It's time for another virtual morning report. And today we're going to be looking at abdominal pain and diarrhea, March 5th, 2021. That's actually my birthday. So let's、uh, see what this case is all about. This is a case of a 36 year old male with six months of abdominal pain and diarrhea. So, six months before the abdominal pain started in the lower right quadrant with the radiation to the right lumbar region, that pain aggravates with movement. He also referred no variation. With food intake at all. Four months before,、uh, he started having fever and diarrhea, four episodes per day with mucus, no blood. He was treated with cyprofloxacin because they thought it was an infectious diarrhea, but the patient referred no improvement. Three months before, he referred、uh, a development of a hard rock painful mass. In the right lower quadrant abdomen. In all the course of the disease, he had lost 15 kilograms. In past medical history,、uh, he has a history of a chronic annual fissure. Here, we've already gotten a lot of concerning things, most notably the fever and diarrhea with mucus. All kind of pointing to an inflammatory diarrhea. And so, once we're starting、uh, with an inflammatory diarrhea picture that's also chronic, the most common thing we would consider in a young patient like this would be inflammatory bowel disease. And so, that kind of skyrocketed to the top of my differential.、Um, this would go along with having weight loss as well. And just again, this chronic picture with fever and diarrhea. But the one thing that does not kind of fit with that is this. Painful right lower quadrant mass. So,、uh, when I hear about that, that doesn't really fit my illness script for inflammatory bowel disease. And、uh, it makes me wonder could this now be something malignancy related? And what kind of malignancy could cause profuse diarrhea? That could be something like carcinoid syndrome.、Uh, Masses itself, masses themselves can also lead to diarrhea because you start to get blockage of、uh, the GI tract and then you end up having overflow incontinence. So it is possible, but for a 36 year old person to have like colon cancer, it is becoming more common recently, but it just doesn't seem as likely as some other things that could be going on.、Um, and the right lower quadrant, again, it's making me think like, can carcinoid be like this,、um, you know, present with a mass? It's kind of in the right lower quadrant oftentimes in that ileal area and can. Cause diarrhea. All right. And this、uh, chronic anal fissure、uh, is again making me think about、uh, inflammatory bowel disease because we think about the complications of inflammatory bowel disease and you think about things like strictures, you think about、uh, fistulas. It is possible that this chronic anal fissure is actually. Uh, not necessarily a fissure, but it could be a fistula or some manifestation of an inflammatory bowel disease instead. The other thing I wanted to mention is what really took it. This person's so long to present for evaluation. I mean, it looks like they did go to get some、uh, ciprofloxacin for a possible infectious diarrhea at one point, but developing a painful right lower quadrant mass three months ago and losing 15 kilograms that's like 30 plus pounds.、Um, you would think that this person would be presenting earlier to receive care. So it is definitely surprising that they're presenting so late. Family history, no remarkable. Social history, he lives in San Martin. And for taking in context with you guys,、uh, San Martin is a tropical humid region in the northern east of Peru. The climate is kind of the Amazon.、Uh, and he came to Lima because in his local hospital they couldn't find an etiology. So this,、uh, now it makes more sense. This person probably has poor access to care. They're kind of more in a developing country. And、uh, it is interesting that he added on the、uh, information that this is like a climate. Clim-、uh, That this is kind of like a tropical area. I'm not sure what kind of specific infectious etiologies you can now start to consider. But again, if we're still in that bucket of inflammatory diarrhea, besides inflammatory bowel disease, we can also think about infectious causes.、Um, and in developing countries, we always have to consider tuberculosis. And this is not something we commonly see, but something like this could be very commonly、uh, some kind of. Uh, abdominal TB presentation. And I've seen abdominal TB present with large masses and it's got biopsied. You can see the necrotizing granuloma in there. So I actually have seen abdominal TB in patients who presented from developing countries. So that immediately opens up that side of a differential as well. A past medical history also, he was diagnosed with XDR TBC 10 years prior presentation, but he, com- but he completed the treatment. Okay, so he actually had. 
uh, TB. I don't know what XTR TB is. Maybe I'll look that up. Uh, XDR TB, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. So uh, now tuberculosis is kind of shooting up very, very high. Now that we have the information that he's from a developing country, he's had a history of TB. He has this right lower quadrant mass. Abdominal TB can definitely present with uh, abdominal masses. So that's shooting up very high. Temperature 37 Celsius, heart rate 86, blood pressure 150 over 70, respiratory rate 18. In the physical exam, general appearance, he looked very pale. The vitals and are very unremarkable. Lymphatic exam, there was no cervical or inguinal adenopathy, but uh, it was noted an axillary lymphadenopathy with suppuration. So if he's pale, his hemoglobin is probably quite low, which would go with having a chronic diarrhea and probably poor nutrition, as well as possibly just chronic inflammation from this disease. So um, very likely that his hemoglobin is, I would just guess, less than eight um, or even more, just in setting up this chronic inflammation and infectious process. If the abdomen exam, it was noted a mass of four and two centimeters in the right lower quadrant that was painful to touch and no mobile. All right, so they had a really good discussion and I just wanted to very briefly summarize it. But basically, when they're talking about the right lower quadrant, you kind of consider three things. You consider whether this is a sequel process, whether it's the appendix, or whether it's the ilium. And of course, many things can involve the ilium because that's where all of the Peyer's patches are and you have a lot of immunologic activity there. So a lot of immunologically active diseases love to target the ilium. And so TB is certainly something like that. Inflammatory bowel disease could also present there and have significant ileal involvement. And then some other infectious causes that might be related in this situation could be things like actinomycosis, histoplasmosis, and entamoeba histolytica. So that was some great additional differential that they provided there. And uh, let's see where this case goes now. The hemoglobin 7.5, is that what we got, Gabriel? Yeah. And white right. count was 16.6? Yeah, right. And platelets, uh, 760,000. All right, so I guessed uh, less than eight or seven for the hemoglobin. It looks like we were pretty pretty much spot on. Hemoglobin, 7.5, leukocytosis of 16.6, and platelets of 760, which is likely reactive in setting of the inflammation. Reticulocyte count, 2%. Mean corpuscular volume, 84. INR, 1.3. Total bilirubin, 0.6. Liver enzymes, TGO 90, TGP 35. I think TGO is AST and TGP is ALT. Sodium 133, potassium 3.2, chloride 105, glucose 80, 87, creatinine 1, erythrocyte sedimentation rate was 52, was elevated, albumin 4, Occult blood test was positive. Fecal leukocytes uh, were 70 per gram. They also did microscopy of the fecal sample, searching for strandiloides. It was negative. They only found yardia lamblia, trophozoites. They also did a double contrast mm. colon x-ray, which I can show you, that showed a proliferative and infiltrative process in the second and ascendant colon. While doing that, they also did a colonoscopy that showed an iliosecal infiltrative and ulcerated lesion and other ulcers in the transverse colon. So I don't have a CT, but this is a double contrast X-ray that show an infiltrative process near the cecum and in the transverse colon also. Here there is like the contrast is not passing well, so that was the most impressive finding. Um, colonoscopy, I don't have it, but they saw a um, big ulcer, infiltrative ulcer in the cecum and other ulcers in the transverse colon. So here, um, what I want to say is, uh, obviously, here in the U.S., we would have a CT scan. It would give us a, a better picture. But it is interesting to see what resources are available in other countries. But kind of when you see this kind of appearance here, it's kind of like a stricture or like an apple core lesion where it's tightening that contrast so it's not passing very well. And then he's kind of describing that there is ulcerated lesions found in the right lower quadrant. 
as well as um, kind of lesions in the transverse colon. So when it's kind of bringing it up like that, to me, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of skip phenomenon, which is obviously for Crohn's disease, where you're going to get a lot of that terminal ileal involvement, and then skip lesions that kind of jump around, as opposed to ulcerative colitis, where you're going to have that kind of pan uh, contiguous involvement starting from the rectum and ascending from the rectum upwards. So uh, this kind of fits with Crohn's disease, although Crohn's disease, I don't typically associate with having a four by two centimeter mass, but I do wonder if these are skip lesions that he's describing. All right, so they kind of uh, discussed what the possibilities were here. And ultimately, you know, we're not going to know until the biopsy results come back. But they were talking about infection being high on the differential and different, different things that could be causing it could be CMV, HIV, granulomatous infections, fungal infections. All of them could be compatible. But then if infection is excluded, then this could also very much be compatible with Crohn's disease. Again, also uh, associated with abscesses as well. I forgot to mention that earlier. And so that was kind of similar to my line of thinking as well. So the biopsy didn't show entamoeba histolytica, no, it wasn't positive for markers for lymphoma. So it was positive for paracoxidioides brasiliensis, as we shall say later in the chat. You can see some gist like and sheep will appearance. Well, that is certainly a surprising diagnosis and a reason that, you know, we would miss a diagnosis like this is because this is just not something we see very commonly. Paracoxidiotes, of course, being more common in like Central America, South America, uh, even more so. Um, so this is not even something that really would be on our radar. And yet, even in our course of working this patient up and doing a colonoscopy and getting a biopsy, we would have also uh, had the pathologist review this and would have been able to make the diagnosis. So very, very interesting, something that really would not be commonly seen for us. And so it's definitely a very interesting case. What I learned from this case is that um, learning the risk factors, so they were clues in the past medical history and who the patient was. Uh, first, he was a male patient, as we shall uh, did um, made a tweet yesterday that paracoxidioides is most prevalent in males because estrogens have a protective effect in the progression of the disease. And also they are more reported in humid tropical areas. Here in Peru, uh, it's endemic in Loreto, San Martin, endemic uh, like climate similar to the Amazon. But the most reported cases in the world are from Brazil and Colombia. And also what I learned from this case is that paracoxidioides, if present if it, it has a gastrointestinal manifestation, the most common location would be the ileocecal valve and the secum. It has a predispose to, to infect that place. And in the colonoscopy, you would see ulcers, you will see um, infiltrative lesions similar to Crohn's. It can uh, be a, it can very, it can be a Crohn's mimicker and tamoeba histolytica mimicker too. But the gastrointestinal manifestations are rare. So before thinking in paracosidioides, you should think in TB, then TB, then TB, because TB has a iliocecal prevalence too. And then you should think of histoplasma and lymphoma first before thinking paracosidioides because the manifestations are rare there. Uh, so you did, uh, you guys did very well. Uh, ah, sorry, I will also would like to add that uh, another clue in this case was the axillary lymphadenopathy with superation because if there is any lymph lymph involvement, then is the if accompanied with gastrointestinal manifestations, uh, paracoxidioides is one probability, taking in consideration the patient was from an endemic area. So that's what I learned from this case, and I hope you guys like it. Wow, so crazy case, you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to hear how medicine goes in other parts of the world and in developing countries where the resources are different and also the exposures are also different. Definitely can lead to very interesting presentations like this one. So I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. Let me know if you were able to get the diagnosis right and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.